Um, this is our midweek service. We say thank you for joining us. I know a lot of you are probably just now coming into the feed, so I'll give you some time to get in here. Um, but this is, we're trying out new formats of our midweek Bible studies. We want to bring it to you in a format that may be a little bit more intimate to your home setting, um, a little bit more personable so we can walk through the study together. Uh, many of you know we are in the book of Mark. We're walking through the book of Mark together. This week I am kicking off Mark chapter 2. And so as you are all coming in to join us on our live feed today, we say thank you. We welcome you. And I'm just going to open us up with prayer. God, we thank you for this time of study. We thank you for the transformative power of your word. Thank you that your Holy Spirit is able to lead and to guide us into better understanding and practical application, God. So God, as we come before you, looking at your word and searching your scripture in this text, God, we ask that you give us revelation and wisdom and show us how to walk out this text as we read it and as we study together to become more mature and obedient Christians in our faith walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody have their Bibles with them or an iPad or an iPhone, some type of form of technology where you can have the Bible available to you and or a good old paperback. I have two translations here tonight. I have NIV, which I will be reading from quite a bit, but I also have the New King James, which I have printed here on my uh, text for the evening. So as I said, we're picking up here in Mark chapter 2. Last week, Minister JV covered Mark chapter 1 for us. We had a really good time through our technical difficulties. Then we went live afterwards to just kind of hammer in the point of the Mark chapter 1. I am picking up today on Mark chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, we'll begin. And so the amazing thing about the book of Mark is the simplicity of the text. And the swift movement from miracle to miracle, from movement to movement, Mark gives us just enough detail to invite the reader on this journey to discover who Jesus is. That's important. Mark takes us on a journey to discover who Jesus is through the simplicity of his text, through the simplicity of his writing style, through the almost snapshot, snap, snapshot moment to moment, from movement to movement, miracle to miracle. We go on this journey with Mark, and he gives us enough details that we can follow along. The, the book of Mark can be closely considered as an eyewitness um, through Mark, who because Mark was an acquaintance of Paul. He was the nephew of Barnabas, and he was also a follower of Peter. So as we read through Mark, we want to keep that in mind, that this is believed to be the first of the Gospels written, and... Um, of the Gospels, I would argue that it starts with the most confident statement of who Jesus is. We're going to, I'm, we're going to begin with Mark chapter 2 tonight, but I'm going to flip us back a page to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 1 reads, The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. As I said, I would arguably say the Gospel of Mark starts with the strongest statement of who Jesus is. This is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God is how Mark begins this, this Gospel. So as we continue to journey through Mark, we'll begin to understand more about Jesus and his ministry. Minister J.B. mentioned last week in Mark 1, we see God's validation of Jesus. That was one of the points that Minister J.B. last week saw and pointed out to us last week, is that we saw the validation of who Jesus was by God. Mark 1.11 reads, Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So we have the validation through God of who Jesus is, but I want to take us on a journey through Mark chapter 2, where Jesus verifies himself. In Mark chapter 2, I would like to draw our attention to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. To verify means to make sure or to demonstrate that something is true. And that's exactly what we see of Jesus in Mark chapter 2. We see that he is the Son of God, 
given authority by God to heal the sick, to eat amongst sinners, to prove the emptiness of religious rituals, and that he is Lord of the Sabbath. And so we're going to see that broken down in four different sections, four different parables throughout Mark chapter 2. And I want us to take an in-depth walk through each one of those parables. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus verifies himself. He proves that something is the case, something is true, and it is proven to be the fact. So let us begin with Mark 2, picking up in verse 1. And it reads, And again he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together, so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Mark chapter 2, verses 5 is where we're at right now. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Picking up in verse 8. But immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk, picking up in verse 10, but that you may know that the son of man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed and went out to, went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. In this particular passage, I've heard it preached, I know a lot of us are more familiar probably with the lens and the context of the faith of the friends. We have four friends here that carried this man. They see that they couldn't make it through the, through the entrance because there was just that many people gathered to see and to hear what Jesus had to say. There was just that many people that going through the front door wasn't an option. Going around back wasn't an option. The only option they saw fit to get their friend in the presence of Jesus was to lift him and drop him down from the roof. So we have that understanding. And a lot of times we focus on the faith of the friends, but I actually want to take a different lens and a different perspective tonight. I want us to actually bring our attention to the thoughts of the scribes and the Pharisees. They said, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? You see, the question they asked was not wrong. The motive behind the question was wrong. They asked such a question to disprove who Jesus was. They believed that only God can heal people of sins. Only God can be the forgiver of sins. So how did, does this man come saying, your sins are forgiven. He has no such authority to make such a statement, such a bold proclamation. So they're questioning, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Again, this is the right question asked, but with the wrong motive. They wanted to disprove Jesus, but in fact, Jesus only verified and solidified who he was in such a simple statement. But before we get there, I want us to pause. Notice. Jesus did not have time to argue his point on this. He didn't make this a moment to argue with them and to say, I am the son of God. I am. He didn't have the, the want to, to argue this point. But he did still prove a point through his actions, through his follow through of what he was commanded to do. I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Jesus answered the very question they were asking. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And Jesus said, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out into the presence of them all, so that all were amazed, 
and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Arise. Arise. Arise proved the authority Jesus had because it had power behind it. And once the man actually arose, this showed the proof of Jesus' power in the spiritual realm. Jesus didn't have to argue with the people. He simply did what only could be done if he was, in fact, who he said he was. So he answered the question, who can forgive sins but God alone? He simply answered their question by performing this miracle. He says to the man, arise. And this validates his authority and the power that he has. Because once he said, arise, the man immediately arose, took up his bed, and walked away. That speaks and proves the, that Jesus had the power to forgive sins by demonstrating his power to cure the sick man. The amazing thing about the book of Mark is that it, it, it kind of flows, but it seems sporadic as we jump from moment to moment. It doesn't seem like there's any consistency in it sometimes because it's just like, okay, Jesus is this, Jesus is this, and we just go to the next movement, to the next movement. But that's also the great thing about this book of Mark is because the simplicity of this is revealing that Jesus is verifying himself the whole time through different events. Mark shows us the account. Then we go into Mark. We go into this next um, section of Mark uh, where your Bibles might say like mine, Jesus calls Levi and eats with sinners. Um, Mark shows us the account of Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners. So picking up we are in Mark 2, starting in verse 13. Um, actually, we're not going to start at 13. Let me see where I want to pick up the text exactly. We will start in 13. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Levi, also known to us as Matthew, um, and he says, follow me. Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. We're going to pause right there. If you have a writing utensil, if you're using a physical Bible, if you have the ability to highlight in your app or whatever device you're using, I want you to highlight, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. That's notable. That it didn't, again, we don't see a moment of pausing, of reflecting, of thinking, shall I follow him? But it says that he got up and he followed him. That's what the call of God looks like for us as believers today. I want to correlate that for us today, that Jesus calls and we follow. Jesus asks and we do. Jesus does and we do. It's just that simple, but it's that intentional. Picking up in 15. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his, disciple, his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous but the sinner. Jesus is the son of God. His mission was to save that which were lost, to heal the sick, and to restore. What Jesus' response essentially is saying is, my mission directs me to these people, to people of the light, to the sinner, to the tax collectors, those who were outcasted, those who were openly known and rejected by many. My mission actually calls me to these people. Again, Jesus is intentional in proving that who he is is the exact representation of what these so-called spiritual leaders and the Pharisees believed in. But he was actually proven that a lot of their rituals and a lot of their doctrine and a lot of the things that they believed were inaccurate because he was proving to them that he is the answer. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. And he says... Uh, picking up in 17, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Jesus has come to call the sinners. So it, we have to be careful in our own righteousness that we don't become like the Pharisees where we question where Jesus sits. 
when he sits amongst the sinners, when he shows up amongst the sinners, when he shows up amongst those who we've deemed broken and misfit and ostracized and we've outcasted, when he shows up in the midst of those people, that's exactly the mission that he was sent here to do. And we as co-laborers, we as partners, we as new creations in this ministry of reconciliation, to our call to that very same ministry, we are called to sit amongst the sinners, not to transform and to become like them, but that we walk in the authority, we walk in a gospel that has the ability to transform the sinners' lives. So Jesus is showing them, I'm, I'm here. I can sit amongst them. These are the people I came to save. But you all, in your own righteousness, you think you have it figured out. You think you know um, the rituals and you have the laws. You have it figured out. So you know what? You have it figured out. I'm not here for you. I'm here for those who don't have it figured out quite yet. So he sits amongst the tax collectors and the sinners. So it's also, <clears throat> excuse me, notable that we ought to be careful that we don't judge where Jesus sits. What good is it if we, like the Pharisees, only talk amongst ourselves? What good would that be? We've been saved. We're born again. We're believers. We say that we believe in the transformative power of the gospel. What good is it if we only gather amongst ourselves? If we only gather amongst those who believe the way that we believe? What good is it? Do we bring anyone into the fold? Do we bring anybody into the body? Do we reveal this truth to anyone besides ourselves? Or are we comfortable being the crowd that just gathers around, but we don't bring a fresh revelation, or we don't bring the truth or newness to those who just may not know that they're walking in sin. They may not know that they're living in sin. When was the last time, and I want you to think about this, excuse me, <clears throat> when was the last time you found yourself in the midst of a crowd that didn't look like you? In the midst of people that didn't look like you? In the midst of people who didn't believe like you? When was the last time you found yourself in that situation? And if you can't think of a time, I would challenge you or dare you to toggle in your mind this thought. Are you actually doing the mission of Christ? He sat amongst the tax collectors. He sat amongst the sinners. Are you partnered in this mission with Christ to be amongst those who didn't seem like they were deserving? See, the Pharisees looked at the, the tax collectors and they questioned and they asked, why would he sit amongst them? How can he eat amongst them? And they thought these were people that Jesus, a character like Jesus, should have hated. Yet he showed compassion and he pitied this group of people. That's what we are called to do. We sit amongst them and we show compassion and we show the truth of Jesus Christ. We share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Picking up in 18. The, um, oh, sorry. That I, I went a little too far ahead. Um, like Jesus, our mission as born-again believers should in fact draw us near to those who need him. What good is it if we only talk amongst ourselves? And so right now we've only gone through the first couple of passages here in Mark. We have Jesus forgives and heals the paralyzed man. We see that the friends bring in the paralytic and he is healed he forgives him of his sins he says arise and he walks jesus shows us his authority and that he has the authority to forgive sins through the healing of this man then we get to jesus calls levi and eats with sinners now jesus has just called him and he immediately followed and then we see that jesus is next found sitting having dinner amongst sinners and tax collectors he then is questioned again Throughout Mark, we'll see that Jesus is questioned over and over and over. But Jesus proved and verified himself every time, not through argument, but through action. That is important to note. He did not have to verify who he was through argument, but through action. Doing what he was sent to do, when he was sent to do it, in front of those who would be watching. And if you look in the text, you'll see that it says that, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking. That's back to Mark chapter 2, uh, verse 8. He knew in his spirit what they were thinking. And then we come down further in the text, and then it says, on hearing this. So Jesus is addressing their reality. He's addressing what he, he has heard spiritually. He's addressing their thoughts. He's addressing their mindset. Then he's actually addressing what he's heard them say. So Jesus actually addresses every reality through the verification of who he is. 
Next, Jesus addresses their questioning of fasting. When we're moving through Mark chapter 2, like I said, this is the way Mark goes. Mark jumps from moment to moment, but each moment is intentional in showing us and displaying to us who Jesus is. As I mentioned, Mark starts with a very strong, confident statement saying, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. He comes in very strong, very confident that this is who Jesus is. So we see that thing just flowing throughout Mark. We see the humanity of Christ as well as the deity of Christ as we continue to read throughout Mark. Picking up in Mark chapter 2, verses 18, um, and we're just going to read through there. The disciples of John and the Pharisees were fasting. They came and said to him, Why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast? But your disciples do not fast. This is, again, they're presenting another question. And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. What I love most right here is the part of the text is Jesus, again, verifies beside them. They have no need to fast. So Jesus, again, he's coming against this doctrine and this belief system that they have instilled in themselves at this point, and he's directly combating everything that they're questioning with the truth and the reality of who he is. So he pretty much poses this question back. Why would they, if I am here, if I am the presence in which they were fasting for and I am standing beside them, there is no need for them to fast. The presence they fasted for is yet amongst them. Throughout this chapter 2 of Mark, we see over and over again, they made their own practices a standard, and Jesus disrupts the way of, their way of thinking by showing that he is the standard. And I'm going to read that again, because that is a point I really want to hone in on. We see over and over again, they made their own practices a standard, and Jesus disrupts this way of thinking by showing he is the standard. So every ritualistic religious belief that they had and they have formed of why Jesus couldn't do this and why Jesus couldn't do that was to them verifying this belief system they had around Jesus. But how do you give those standards or how do you give those rules to Jesus himself? If everything you were doing is in the belief that there is a Messiah coming and now he's standing before you, how then do you give him the standard that he should live by to prove his own existence? So Jesus comes and he completely disrupts this line of thinking by actually showing that he is the standard. And we see it throughout the text. I am here. There's no reason for them to fast in my presence or for, and I am here. I am with them. I am present. And we see that. And I think that's so exciting to point out in the text that he disrupts every train of thought that they've had. And he still does that. We see that all the time. Jesus will disrupt our toxic form of thinking because we've been in church, we've been doing it this way, we've believed this for so long, Big Mama taught us this, the pastor said that, and because we've heard it over and over, we start to believe it and we build a doctrine based on opinions of well-intended folks that have no Jesus in it. And Jesus comes and he shakes everything up. He just shakes their whole reality up by actually being the standard that they say that they're pursuing or they that they believe they're pursuing. The text goes on and says, but the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away um, from them, and then they will fast in those days. That's to say, these are the easier days, <laughs> but the time will come where I won't be here and they'll need to fast. These days are not as complicated as the days to come when I'm absent from them. Those days, they'll need to fast, is what Jesus is saying here. Um, and you see, the Pharisees, they were always worried about the wrong thing, but Jesus addressed every concern by his very existence. But those days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away, and I'm picking up back in um, verse 20. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. No one sews a piece of unstruck cloth on an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away. Again, Jesus is giving this example and he's making this, um, this real to them, to their understanding of he's here. Um, let's see. And no one puts new wine 
into old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts the wineskins. The wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined, but new wine must be put into new wineskins. Jesus is saying that I am here. I am that which they fasted for. And so, as we transition into this last section of Mark, I want to emphasize that we have to be careful that our our rules and our and our rituals and our belief systems aren't tailored around what we think Christ is asking of us, what we believe that he's requiring of us, but actually what what does his word say about a matter? What does he say? When he shows up, if we presented our beliefs to Jesus, if we presented our rituals to Jesus, what would he say? Would he respond to us the same way he did to these Pharisees many times? Would he respond to them as if, that's kind of foolish, you know? If you, if you kind of look at the text, you can see Jesus kind of, in a very polite way, having them question what they thought they believed. But he doesn't directly say anything to the regard of, you're a fool. But he is saying, okay, in all your wisdom and all the knowledge that you have concerning these things and all your rituals and all your religion, does that actually make sense? Again, he's disrupting the standard that they have been living by. And again, I want to note that a private practice becoming a standard isn't always what God intends for us. We have to be careful when someone's private practice begins to be our standard of living. What does God's word actually say? Always bring it back to what does God's word actually say? Not what we filled in the gaps with, not what we've assumed, not how we put the pieces together. Don't get in these foolish arguments, trying to point. But what does the word actually say? What is the standard that has actually been written out for us to follow? What does it say? So as we wrap up here in this last section of Mark chapter 2, I hope you're following. I hope you're taking notes. I hope you've highlighted. I hope you've pointed out some, the, some good points as we're studying. Um, and we're just going to pick up in this last area of chapter 2. Picking up in 23. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields. And his disciples walked along. They began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said, again, we have the voice of the Pharisees and the thoughts of the Pharisees presenting themselves. Notice how the Pharisees were always onlookers to what Jesus was doing. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need in the days of I, but I hope I say this correctly. I've been practicing to say this. In the days of Abiathar and high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some, some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Jesus explains that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. This is honing in on the point that we, man creation, we were made for God. And God saw fit to make the Sabbath for us. The Sabbath was this intentional day of not working, not toiling, not doing anything that required too much of yourself. But this day of rest was after and was made for mankind, not us, not us for it. Therefore, the Sabbath honored us, not we the other way around. The Sabbath was not to restrain us from our necessities. They needed to eat in order to continue on doing the work ahead of them. God is just that intentional. God is just that intentional that in this part of the scripture, when Jesus says the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. God wraps Jesus wraps his whole part up and saying, I am the Son or the Son of Man is the Lord even of even of the day of rest. I reign even over that day, which has been given unto you, which is for you. I reign even over that day. So again, like I said, the Pharisees are on the fears they constantly have something to say. And we see that Jesus throughout this text, he is addressing 
every concern, every thought, mm. every moment they are thinking too highly of themselves than they ought, he's addressing it time and time again. We have to be careful that we don't overwork ourselves trying to follow the laws of men. And I, I read this in a uh, commentary, and I just wanted to point it out. And it said, um, be careful that as young Christians that we are not to overwork ourselves, lest we run the risk of making the yoke of Christ anything but easy, sweet, and pleasant. I'm going to read that again. Least we run the risk of making the yoke of Christ anything but easy, sweet, and pleasant. Jesus throughout this chapter is showing the Pharisees over and over again the limitations of their doctrine and the freedom that is actually found in the Son of God. And we see that. We see that throughout this text. He is completely disrupting their doctrine, completely disrupting their standards. He says that I am the standard. I am the Son of God. I am the Messiah. We see that Jesus shows this over and over and over. And that's where the freedom is found. Because in everything that Jesus, if we go back into the text, we see that there was more freedom found in who Jesus was proving himself to be and bringing that freedom than there was in these laws and these rituals that the Pharisees kept trying to bestow upon him. And he's like, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. I am the Messiah. I am Jesus. I'm showing you. I'm telling you. This is how it works. And so we see he disrupts this time and time again. Mark gives us just enough detail to that explains only the Son of God could do such things, which again leads us back to Mark's opening statement, which reads, The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. Again, I believe that this gospel starts with the most confident statement of who Jesus is. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And so we're going to continue to see that as we walk through Mark. Um, as Minister JB continues to walk us, as Pastor Aaron continues to walk us, and myself as we journey through this book of Mark. Again, we get to see the humanity of Christ as well as the deity of Christ. And Mark is so good at taking us from moment to moment, but giving us enough detail to support the statement that he begins this gospel with. Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Amen want to thank you for joining us this evening. Hope you were able to get um, enough meat out of our study tonight. Um, at this moment, I'm having Minister JB come up for and Pastor Proctor, apparently. Uh, Minister JB will, coming, uh, will be coming up. Amen. Can we even soberly give God praise for the message and the messenger? Come on, give, it, give us those clap emojis. <laughs> At this time, Minister Alonga has done a fantastic job, and we're, we're excited to see what God has in store for us next week. Amen. We want to have a moment of prayer, because typically, as it is our custom at Church by the Side of the Road, we have Bible study, and we morph into prayer. So we want to just uh, call some of these names out that are on the prayer list. Uh, knowing that this is the World Wide Web, we won't put everybody's detail, but we're just going to list the names. Uh, Miss Glenda Wiggins asks for prayer today. Sister Janet asks for prayer today. Brother Leon Wilson needs our prayers. Brother David uh, just commented in the uh, in the comment section. He needs our prayers. Miss Patsy Bovan needs our prayers. Brother Charles and Sister Terry, Miss Bobby and the entire uh, family of Miss Joy Adams, uh, Miss Iris and Sister Lottie, Sister Yolanda, uh, my cousin Courtney and Dorothy, uh, Bart Peterson and Miss. Uh, Miss uh, uh, Angelica and Miss Ophelia and all those who are suffering with this uh, COVID-19, all those who are putting their lives, all of our first responders who are putting their lives at risk, um, we thank God for them. And our good, our pastor's good friend, Brother Roland Webb, amen, uh, we want to lift them up in prayer. So let, let us bow together and pray. Dear kind and heavenly Father, we do thank you. Lord, we thank you for this is the day that you have made, and we promise to rejoice and be glad in it. Now, Lord, there are many of the, those who are standing in the need of prayer, Lord. You, you know every need, dear God. You know everything that needs to be orchestrated and aligned to your purpose. So, Lord, we pray that you would have your way in the hearts and the minds of your people. Lord, we thank you for what you have brought us through and, 
and the, the things that you have brought us through in the past as a testimony to what you will do for us in the future. Because as the saints of old said, I don't believe you brought us this far if you were just going to leave us. So Father, we ask you to pray a special prayer for this church. We pray for our pastor, our leadership. We pray for our country and our nation, dear Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you for the word that was brought forth tonight. We pray for the messenger of God as she has brought forth the word. And Lord, that we ask you to strengthen her as she is poured out into us, dear God. Now, and let us pray together, even at home, as, you, as Jesus has taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Go in peace. Go in grace. See you next week.